Hello there. Welcome to the Paley Zookeeper Association. My name is Austin. This video is going to be a little bit different than how my videos usually are. This is going to be more like a rant than anything else. This is primarily because we, earlier today I was reading some articles, watching a video or two, and reading comments on. Let's just say, let's just say they triggered me. And it basically comes back to a question. Is the extinction, the resurrection of a previously extinct species, stupid? This also kind of makes me remember that there was a time when people would say the exact same things about how we do conservation nowadays. For example, the black-footed ferret. When we rediscovered an isolated population of black-footed ferrets in a prairie dog town, we learned that they, these, these ferrets were dying from canine distemper. And while there were calls at the time to save these black-footed ferrets and get them into captivity for captive breeding, a lot of the um, conservationists at the time, especially like older style conservationists, went against this and said they should be left out there or heck some could even say let them die out there even to the point that people who have tried to trap these uh, ferrets so they can bring them in captivity those traps were torn apart and the ferrets were let go and this continued on until only seven individuals were left and they were all brought into captivity and now thanks to the Thanks to the uh, unorthodox uh, conservation methods at the time, now we have hundreds of black-footed ferrets, several of which are being released back into the wild. Another example would be um, con the California condor. When only like around a dozen wild condors were left in the wild, and then when they were captured and taken back into captivity, there was a lot of criticisms. A lot of people will even say they should just let them loose so that they can just die with dignity. To the point that they had to use razor wire and such and nighttime guards to protect the condors. But now, thanks to the efforts of those conservationists that, that, kept, the con that kept the condors, they were able to breed hundreds of them now and even release some back into the wild. Another example of going against criticism is the Cincinnati Zoo's work with the Sumatran Rhino. Now, the story about the Sumatran Rhino is very interesting. When they brought the breeding pairs into the United States, not a lot of people knew about them and they thought they would just adapt like regular rhinos. Unfortunately, they didn't go for hay and grain for the same way that most other rhino species had. So, basically, the keeping of the Sumatran rhinos in the, in, in the Cincinnati Zoo, for example, was a long deal of trial and error. Hay, did, hay and grain didn't work. They learned that fig, tree, fig trees uh, worked, worked out pretty well. No one knew how to be able to get them to start breeding. They, they were able to learn how to do that and even found out that... The right that Sumatran rhinos don't ha don't don't go into heat in season like other species of rhinos do. So there's that, and then and then there and then the female Sumatran rhino that was in the Cincinnati Zoo was having difficulties maintaining uh, pregnancy several times. So they learned that they can use equine uh, regimate in order or an artificial progesterone in order to keep help maintain pregnancy. And this has led to uh, the, the birth of six Sumatran rhinos born in captivity at that time. Before then, it was like over a hundred years before any Sumatran rhino was ever born in captivity. Even throughout this whole trial and error, and even with some success, there were a lot of critics say that it was just a big waste of time and money. I don't think so. We learned more about the Sumatran rhinos going through that trial and error process than we ever had before. And of course there was a lot of time and a lot of money 
But when you're dealing with conservation, while money is important, it shouldn't be the main focus. And nowadays, we have some projects going on throughout the conservation that kind of are very similar to the extinction projects that are being commenced as we speak. One of which is cloning. We have cloned uh, black-footed ferrets in the past, and a couple years ago, we cloned the first uh, Shavalski's wild horse clone stallion. That's currently living in the San, San Diego Zoo Safari Park. And just, just, a, and just recently, we have another one that was born. Both of which are, are both of which are essential to be able to help with the gene pool of the modern-day Savalski's horses. And the American chestnut tree. A, a, a hundred years ago or so, a, a, a blight, a fungus infection, almost wiped out all the American chestnut trees. And nowadays, we there is a project going on that are genetically engineering. Uh, these uh, American chestnut trees to be able to resist this plight. And, and currently, we have the Northern White Rhino Project, which is working on a functionally extinct species that cannot be able to replenish itself by, it, by itself. So, they are working on a project to be able to help bring, bring, bring new individual nor Northern White Rhinos into the world. And if this and if this project succeeds, this project has a lot of potential to both save other species of rhinos from black rhinos, Sumatran rhinos, and even the very rare uh, Javan rhino. And it can even be used for future de-extinct de projects, such as resurrecting the woolly rhino. De-extinction, or resurrection science as some would rather prefer to call it, is just another tool from my, I see it, just another tool in the toolkit of conservation. The reason I would say this is that I would say that resurrecting charismatic species can in fact actually help the, their current habitat. One such example is resurrecting the dodo. There are some that would say it's pointless because they will say it's all pointless because that you know there's invasive there's a lot of invasive species in Mauritius. Way I see it is like there's invasive species everywhere, Australia, New Zealand, and so forth. There are so many places that have invasive species, and there's even some places that have successfully driven some invasive species out. And I can imagine that hunting and control of invasive species would commence even more so in on the island of Mauritius if the dodo was ever resurrected. And whenever that happens, we could be able to take a note from Australia and New Zealand on creating predator-proof fencing for nature sanctuaries, which will, which will provide a, a safe haven for many endangered species that are already over there, such as the pink pigeon and the echo parakeets. These sanctuaries would also provide home for proxy species such as uh, giant land tortoises that are an a proxy species or a surrogate species for, a, for an extinct species of tortoise that was there before. This will be but this will be because of one very obvious one question with a very obvious answer. How do you make a home for a dinosaur for example? You get the plants and the animals that it, that lives with it to help make an appropriate habitat for them. And in the case of the dodo, this will this will be no different. The resurrection of the dodo and protecting the areas where the dodo would live would also be able to encourage resurrection of other extinct species that used to be on Mauritius, such as the broad-billed parrot, the Mauritius owl, and the Mauritian uh, shell duck. Resurrecting the dodo, basically by trying to make, get a home for it, would be able to help uh, save some land from development or turn old farm, old rundown farms and ranches on Mauritius into new nature sanctuaries. Just like how um, cattle stations in Australia have been done for some endangered species. And 
the, the resurrection of the dodo and other extinct Mauritius species can be able to can be able to provide an ecotourist economy for that for that island. In a way, I could see uh, a resurrected dodo's dilemma will be very similar to a critically endangered species that is would be in a similar situation nowadays. The Lord Lao stick insect. It is a species of stick insect that lived on an island between uh, Australia and New Zealand that was wiped out from the main island by by the introduction of black rats. And then in the in the in the two in the early two thousands, there was there was a small population of them found on a little island called Ball's Pyramid. Pyramid. Sorry about that. And, and now, and now we have a, a lot of them being bred in captivity, probably thousands, for all, probably thousands, <laughs> and that island is still, is still suffering from black rats. However, in 2018, there was a, a plan approved to be able to eradicate all the black rats on that island, and then essentially reintroduce the insect, insects back to the island. So if we are this willing to do this for a bug, why couldn't we do the same for the dodo? And for those those of you out there who say, who say that, oh, this is playing God, is it really? What we're doing, is it really? But if I, by that standard, isn't conservation itself playing God? Is being a doctor playing God? And should we, if that's so, then should we stop doing wildlife conservation? Or should we stop being doctors and helping those in need? Is that the case? I will tell you this. My idea of what is playing God was wiping these animals out in the first place. For example, the quaha, a near stripeless uh, zebra that was, that's native to South Africa, it was pretty much being wiped out for sport, meat, and just for it was a pest. It was a competitor, a grazing competitor for livestock. So much so that people would use their skins just to make just to make feed bags. Another example, the great auk, a, a fightless a fightless relative of the uh, of the razor bill, was wiped out for food for. For the for fashion industry and sadly enough for scientific curiosity, and then the Tasmanian tiger or thylacine for short, it was wiped out because it was villainized horrifically, and no one wa no one tried to save it until it was too late was because of scientists at the time thought as marsupials as inferior. And definitely say that extinction for the thassing was inevitable, and it was no point in saving it if it was considered inferior. Now, when I say that we should resurrect all extinct species, to be honest, not always, not really. I mean, I would love to see a T-Rex roam the 21st century, but. Currently, there is no ecosystem that could benefit from a resurrected T-Rex. That doesn't stop me from this YouTube channel, though, that if a T-Rex was resurrected, we gotta make sure how to take care of it properly. And, but, I, 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 fi I figure we go for more resurrected spe- for more recently extinct species. From dodos, thylacines, pasture pigeons, woolly, even the woolly mammoth. Because there is a habitat for them, well, more than just a habitat for them, there is an ecology that could benefit from their presence and existence. And the way I see it, if if the extinction is able to help not only the uh, the recently extinct recently extinct species, resurrected species, but also help species provide a home and a hope for species that are alive today but endangered. Why is that considered a bad thing? 